Welcome back yet again, gang. This is part 6 of our Chapter 25 lecture series for your textbook, Giving Liberty, by Dr. Eric Foner. This section is entitled, New Movements and the Rights Revolution. The focus question for this section is, what were the sources and significance of the rights revolution of the late 1960s? The sexual revolution inspired by 1960s counterculture and its challenges to traditional gender and sexual norms led to a phenomenon known as second wave feminism. And really at the forefront of this second wave of American feminism was a woman by the name of Betty Friedan who wrote a book called The Feminine Mystique. And in this book she criticized the emptiness of consumer culture and portrayed talented and educated women trapped in a world in which marriage and motherhood were the primary ambitions. She identified and defined the suburban home as a comfortable concentration camp for women that kept them confined in these very strict traditional gender roles. In 1966, an organization known as the National Organization for Women, or NOW, was formed, which demanded not only equal rights, but equal opportunities for women. In a similar way that the first flowering of the women's rights movement in the antebellum period of American history was inspired by the sexism that women faced within the abolitionist movement, in the second wave of American feminism was inspired by similar sexism that women face within the radical and civil rights organizations themselves, where women suffered from the assumption of male supremacy, of male leadership within these organizations. In reaction to this, women began using the language of the civil rights movement to demand greater respect and access within that movement itself. Self. And many women drew parallels between the treatment of blacks and the treatment of women. Many women wanted to form a movement of their own and demonstrated and protested against such things as the Miss America pageant, the Playboy magazine, and other tools of oppression as they deemed it. This second wave of American feminism was really centered around the rhetoric of personal freedom, which was an, an insistence by these feminists that freedom should be applied to intimate aspects of life. The personal is political, and especially when it came to sexual and reproductive rights, which, according to these feminists, became essential freedoms, including the right of women to have access as to an abortion. Many of these ideas received a rapid entrance into the mainstream of American culture, including ideas about sexual and reproductive rights, protection against domestic violence, and inequities in the law, in churches, in the workplace, and in the American family. The rhetoric of personal freedom which emerged from the second wave of American feminism also served to undergird the first flowering of the gay rights movement in the 1960s. Although the first gay rights organization was founded in 1951, it didn't gain a lot of traction in the conservative atmosphere of 1950s America. And in many places across the country, gay men and lesbians were labeled as sinful or mentally disordered and targeted by discriminatory laws. Well, the movement was really galvanized in 1969 when the New York City police raided a notorious gay hangout, the Stonewall Inn in New York City, and arrested many prominent gay figures in the New York gay community. This led to a militant gay rights movement, and gay pride marches began to be held in cities across the country, which first opened up the American consciousness to ideas and language of gay rights and gay and lesbian attitudes and lifestyles. 
The 1960s also saw a flowering of Latino activism in the United States, best exemplified by the Chicano movement, which emphasized pride in Latino culture and challenged Latino status as second-class citizens within the United States. Latino activism in general was closely tied with labor struggles, struggles particularly in agricultural work. And Cesar Chavez, the gentleman you see here, and a woman by the name of of Dolores Huerta were leaders of this Latino farm workers movement. There was also the formation of the Young Lords organization in New York, which was modeled after the Black Panthers and was formed in protest of conditions facing Puerto Rican immigrants into New York City. There was also Chicana dissent against male leadership of the Chicano movement, a feminist movement within the Latino activist movement. In general, Latino culture emphasized male domination, or in Latino culture what is termed machismo, and these Chicana dissenters called for equality of women for freedom of all members of La Raza, or the race, as the Chicano movement rhetoric defined it. Not to be left out, the 1960s also saw a surge in a American Indian, Native American activism in this period. And this was really a reaction against a government policy known as termination, which in the 1940s and 1950s was an attempt by the government to dismantle reservations and integrate Indians into mainstream American life during the Truman and Eisenhower administration. Native Americans balked at this policy and demanded economic aid and self-determination on these reservations. And this led to the formation of the American Indian Movement in 1968, which staged protests for greater tribal sovereignty and economic resources. Probably the most famous incident uh, of this American Indian Movement of the 1960s was the occupation of Alcatraz Island, which lasted for several years from 1969 to 1971. The prison on Alcatraz had been shut down for a few decades by this point and pretty much stood abandoned. And Native Americans quickly occupied the island and established it as a sort of autonomous zone for Native Americans. And for a period of two years, successfully were able to stave off the eviction of the island by the authorities and use that occupation as a platform to spread the American Indian movement message across you know, American social and political consciousness. The tensions and the pressures on American society and politics that were a manifestation of these various protest and reform movements really forced the government's hand in acknowledging new rights for all Americans in this period. In the 1960s saw the Supreme Court vastly expand the rights of all Americans and place them beyond the reach of legislative and local majorities. Some of these cases included Loving versus Virginia in 1967, which struck down laws prohibiting inter interracial marriage. Miranda versus Arizona in 1966, which established that police officers had to read suspects their rights before being arrested. Engel v. Vitale in 1962, which said that prayer and Bible readings in schools was unconstitutional, the final division between church and state. Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965, which overturned a, a law prohibiting contraception. And the decision in this particular case was particularly notable for the Supreme Court recognition of this zone of privacy as they defined it in the decision. A recognition of the right to privacy. And in this decision, the Supreme Court basically said that this right to privacy formed the foundation of all other rights for all Americans. 
1973 saw the Roe v. Wade decision, which established a constitutional right for women to have access to an abortion. And other than these court cases in the Supreme Court, in general, there was a dramatic expansion of the legal rights of women within the domestic sphere, including, for the first time, protection against rape and assault by their husbands. With that, we conclude part six of our chapter 25 lecture series for your textbook, Give Me Liberty by Dr. Eric Foner. Only one more part to go, folks, so hang tight. Until then, study hard, and I'll see you soon.